Whoa, here we have it. (laughs) (laughs) Maria, good to see you. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. I'm very good. I can't believe it's already Thursday. This week has just flown. Absolutely. This has been a fast old week. Maybe it's the winter time. It's, the, the clocks have changed here in the UK. Oh. So it's uh, I'm still kind of trying to get my head around that a little bit just now. Yeah, they haven't changed in North America, though. So I've made a couple of mistakes no. this week. Yes. Shh, Likewise. Don't tell anyone. Yes. Don't tell yes. anyone. So this week we're going mm-hmm. backstage. We're going backstage to another speaker's career. We're going to look about, find where the bodies are hidden in this industry uh, because today we there might wonderful... be some today there, there might, might be some bodies we might hear about some bodies today we've got, we've got a wonderful speaker today joining us jeff birch jeff birch is a leading authority on sales leadership customers and change and has been voted business communicator of the year by the speech writers guild he is a regular contributor and presenter on tv and radio and was the star of bbc television's hit business show all over the shop Currently, Jeff is regularly seen as a business correspondent and presenter for BBC Television's Inside Out program. Due to his love of riding huge motorbikes, the Sunday Times referred to him as the hell's angel of management. And when once he might have been thought of as a disruptive influence, he's now been rehabilitated as an agent of change. Jeff is also the author of many highly successful business books with six currently in print, and has some powerful business messages to bring. But most of all, in our conversation today, we want you to sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. Welcome, Jeff Birch. <laughs> what an intro, hey? God. Welcome, Lord. Jeff. Lovely to have you with us today. It's a it's fabulous cool. intro. Hi. It's a fabulous intro, isn't it? Yeah, we've yeah. made you larger there. Look, we've made you center stage, center screen. Hanging loose. Yeah. yeah, hanging loose, fantastic. And it's wonderful you're going to share with us and take us behind the scenes of your speaking business. Yeah. So, Jeff, I want to know, I want to know, where did it all start? Now, do you want me to be a jolly loony or actually be helpful to your aspiring speakers? Could you do a bit of both? All right. Well, it was, <laughs> first of all, it was an accident, really. I, I got a friend who's a loony. I got a lot of friends who are loonies, but this particular one, I come from way back when, where there just weren't any speakers. The only ones were the big evangelical sales experts, people like John Fenton and uh, uh, Richard Denny and so on were about then. But but on the whole, there weren't very many, and they could fill the Albert Hall, literally. They they would sell tickets through the Sunday Times, because there's no internet then, Close that sale, close that sale. And, and, and 30 quid a ticket and times 10,000 people, you know, and that was when 30 quid was kind of like the equivalent of 300 quid. So they were making, they drove white Rolls Royces and this loony friend of mine said, you could do that, Jeff. And he went and rented a theater and sold tickets to go and see Jeff Birch. But I neglected to tell me, you know. But but in the meantime, I had been working my butt off as a as a management consultant, specialising in getting people's sales up for them. You know, I'd sold my own businesses. Um, I, I I run businesses for years. I'd sold my businesses, and using but the experience of my dad, who was a mad old psychiatrist and an expert in persuasion. And my mum, who was a Cockney businesswoman, and my own business expert, I was doing sales, sales training, sales expertise. And, and, and from that, we filled this theatre. I mean, we actually did it, um, which was quite jolly. But also, one of my big clients who had a chain of shops said, yeah, would you speak at our conference for 20 minutes? And I said, yeah, absolutely, because it would promote my, my sales training business. And anyway, I spoke at the conference and it was very successful. And the guy tucked something in my top pocket. So on the way home, I pulled this thing out. It was a check for 800 quid. That is like a month's money. Like, what? This guy has paid me like nearly a thousand pounds to talk for 20 minutes. And I talked for two days for a tenth of that, you know. (laughs) And off we went. And at the same time, uh harvey jones was doing after dinner speaking and and this he was working for nothing 
and, and actually, the boss was, actually he was charging quite a high fee because we were representing oh, him at that time yeah yeah only, yeah. only because somebody told him to he, he was yeah, a yeah. proper gent and, and and he said oh of course i'll come to your dinner as long as i don't have to pay for my food and and <laughs> And the guy, the, the the founder of, of, I think it was Celebrity Speakers or something, he said, you should be charging. That's you right. should be charging and started charging him out. He was booked every day of the week, but he was an old gentleman then anyway. So they found me. And I think I was on the books of the biggest speaking agency in the country with about four other people. And on and on it went. It, it was a, it was a, bonanza time for speaking unbelievable jeff i remember it well i i was yeah, there well, i remember <laughs> i remember you well i remember strictly come dancing sultry music dancing a tango with you and it was your 21st birthday or something oh you know? and I, I wish i, I wish I it was my 21st that, Maria. i wish yeah. it had been my 21st but it wasn't so james I i'm said, sure you've got sorry yeah so i mean it, it, it's very hard. I mean, but I spoke at a lot of gigs for nothing. I, I, I work really hard to, to, to keep it going. Um, and, and I was in a very lucky time. I, I think if you want to become a success, you've got to have talent. You've got to have luck. And you've got to work your nuts off, literally. And if you neglect any one of those three, you're not going to crack it. I mean, I see a lot of people who work very hard at their speaking career, but they've got absolutely no talent. And then I see people on a tube station playing, playing Stravinsky on a violin, and they just haven't had the luck, you know? It, 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 you've got to get those three or it isn't going to work. Mind you, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So so on that topic of work, I'm always interested in talking with other speakers about how they how they prepare for a speech. What, what does it look like when that client comes to you and says, Jeff, we want to book you to be our closing speaker, opening speaker, whatever the thing may be. Take us through your, your process about how you prepare for that speech. Well, I am very lucky. I have a very, very behind every successful man is a very surprised woman. <laughs> and I have Mrs. Birch, who is she who must be obeyed. And she is the one who has the brains. Again, when I was a hell's angel, I clambered into Cheltenham Ladies College dormitory one night. And that's how I met my wife. And we've been together ever since. Uh, and what happens is she she sits in because I, I talk too much and I'm a loony. Uh, and, and we have briefing calls are very difficult for me with the client because I'm a real bobble hat. Mm. I, I, I'm very interested in engineering. I'm incredibly interested in business. I mean, these shelves behind me are full of every book on psychology, business, everything. I love business. I have a passion for it. But the clients get quite scared. Um, and in, uh, here's an interesting nugget for those of you who want to be speaking stars. I was speaking to a very experienced speaking agent the other day. And he said, Jeff, you scare the clients to death. And I said, why? I said, I, I, I question them intensely. And I question them about the business. I ask them about the pitfalls, about the things they want to achieve. And he said, but it scares them. Because it, mm. it, it, it suggests to the one client told me that they had the impression you didn't know what you were talking about. And he said, I said, yeah, but I, I can't stand these speakers that just have the set speech. Mm. You know, the guy that sailed around the world in a bin bag or dug his way out of a shallow grave using his teeth, you know, and, and then just tries to tie it in the last 10 seconds of his speech to the company he's working for. You know, this this. Agent said, yeah, but Jeff, a lot of my clients feel very comfortable with a speaker that says, yeah, I know. I know what I'm talking about. I'll do my speech. I'll take my money and I'll bugger off. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Birch sits in and intercedes. And I sit there like a sort of pet monkey while she takes down all the details of the client. And then she nags me solidly until the job about have you got your head around that company that makes the cast iron pipes? 
Do you understand what a malleable flange actually is? Do you understand that they've got a discipline problem with the thing? Did you pick up on which story are you going to do about? No, that's a crap one. The last time you did that, we had to run for the aeroplane with a lynch mob after it. You know? and, and so we really prepare. Yes. Obviously, I have some little jolly bon mots. But I'm also aware that if you're too inquisitive, you can scare the clients off. Hmm. We, we were talking before you came on, actually, just about about surgeons and surgery and doctors. I, I remember talking to a surgeon who he trains top surgeons in uh, in London. And he, he, we were talking about this. Um, he was actually talking about surgeons in relation to creativity or innovate, innovation. And he said there's some that uh, who want to when the client comes to them, they want to get some something done. They want the the creativity of certainty, he called it. And then there's another type that want the uh, the creativity of risk. So he was saying that, so the creativity of certainty, is like when you go and get a suit, you and get a, a jacket, you might go into like a, just a regular store, Debenhams when they used to exist, I guess. And you just buy something off the shelf. You knew kind of what it was. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. Fine. And, and you're off. But he said, there's another grouping of people that want certainty. They want a creativity of risk. So they want to have a conversation and say, um, you know, I like this fabric, but I like this thing. And I, and I always, you know, I've got a bit of a pot belly now. So I need to have this thing that's just a little bit, takes a little bit of that from me and makes me look a bit slimmer. Um, but you don't know right at the start what you're getting. Uh, it's in those kind of conversations. So it sounds like what you're doing is you're, you're more, you know, Marie and I have spoken about this, but you're kind of more like tailoring that speech. You're not doing that canned type of presentation. Well, that, that's fair. I, I, I've seen that. Uh, yeah, that, that's very profound. And it's also, in this world of grab and go, there is a leaning towards having something you know. I mean, people are putting their entire business reputation on the annual conference. Mm. And to have what they might suspect is a loose cannon is very scary for them. So we know that we need to reassure them that they're in, a, in safe hands with us. Um, so you is, know, is, which, is there any words that you is there any words that you use, or maybe words that your wife uses? Yes, yes, she does. You know, I, that certainty. I, I've got a friend who who does psychological counselling. Right now, this is very interesting because he helps me too, because I am <laughs> nuts. And anyway, we were doing this thing for this massive client, one of the world's biggest motor manufacturers, who was talking about his sales people. And uh, I said, what's your staff turnover, your sales? He's like 20,000 car salesmen. And they are men, oh, by the way. I'm not being sexist. They've got very few women working there. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, what's your turnover? And he said, 50%. I said, holy crap. I said, that's appalling. And he, he just shut down. And uh, it was, <laughs> it was a poor, it was like we nearly lost that job. And yeah. it, it came up again with a similar client, a similar situation. And this time, my counselor sat in there with me, my friend who's this top emotional counselor. And he said, Jeff, please, God, let me handle this. And the guy said, What's your staff turnover? And he said, 50%. And, and before I said it, he said, oh, my gosh. And how do you feel about that? And the client went, oh, it's crap. I hate <laughs> it. I'm so, and I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, because I am I am a bit autistic -y, And that's what makes me such a great speaker. And it makes me impossible to deal with face to face. Um, I said to I said to somebody, it's like it's like the client wants a firework. What we got, what we want at the end of the conference is a bloody great firework. So, Maria, could you provide us with a bloody great firework? You go, well, Jeff Birch is a bloody great firework. We'll oh, well, bring him into the office and let us meet him. So you wheel in this oil drum with a fuse sticking out of it. And he goes, well, that, that's, uh, what's this? This is the biggest firework we got. It's called the Jeff Birch. 
you know, whatever it is, golden fountain or whatever. Okay, so what does it do? Well, it's spectacular. Well, it looks like an oil drum with a fuse sticking in it. Light it. No, you do not want it to go off in your office. Oh, yes, I bloody do. I need to see it. So when it goes off and you, there's this scorched shadow of the bloke on the wall and he's sitting there with his hair smoking, he's going, bloody hell. And you say, what? This was meant to be put in front of 8,000 people, not let off in your office. So I, I think performers perhaps shouldn't always... I think that's why rock groups always have managers, isn't it? You know, that's why we have really... wonderful people like Maria to help us yeah, on, it, that, on that journey. percent, Maria I used has to, saved I used my to. bacon. I retired <laughs> more often than not. Yeah, I have. I've enjoyed, I've, I've lo I loved working with you, Jeff. Listen, tell yes. me. So you mentioned well, at the beginning. You mentioned at the beginning that somebody put a check in your pocket for eight hundred pounds, and obviously yeah. that's not how you normally set fee levels. No. Um, what advice can you give to anybody listening in, starting out about oh. setting fee levels? Can I tell you a story which infuriated me? Well, when things, we had this guy ring up and said, I want to come and see you. I'm coming up from Cornwall. I'm traveling to the north of England and I must come and see you. Okay. Okay. And this man arrived, a sort of little dumpy middle-aged man with a sort of Hitler mustache and this extremely rotund wife who sat with her handbag on her knee like they do, holding it. And he said, the reason we have come to see you today, Jeff, is that uh, I have this, uh, we, we had happened to see you speaking at a conference. And I said to my good lady, I said, I could do that, didn't I, Marion? You did, Frank. I could do that. So I have decided to become a motivational speaker. So, fine. Well, and he, and he went on to say that he had decided that his fee level would be £5,000 a gig, but he would restrict himself to merely doing two a week. And I, I just, anyway, Sally threw him out, actually, because I'm too polite. But basically, she said, you know, we've worked for nothing. You know, we've driven the motorways all night long. We've worked our way up to where we are. Now, fee level, I make the mistake of saying to my lovely speaking agents, what's the budget? And they tell me a figure and I'll either do it for that or I won't. Um, the only thing, my biggest regret was that when Maria was, was, was queen of all she surveyed, I, I, it was crazy. I would get home from a job. This is, again, slightly, you know, pre-mobile phone and I'd have 20, 30 uh, messages from speaking agents. Jeff, can you do this? Jeff, can you do that? I could have done three jobs a day every day of the week completely. It just You had to beat the customers off with a stick. And we didn't really put our fees up. Some of my colleagues managed to manage the overwork they were doing by pricing themselves out of it. And I, I regret we didn't do that. When people were saying to me, Jeff, you should be charging 25,000 a gig. And I'm, I was at about, I don't know, in those days, 2,000, 2,500 a gig. You know, I, I, we were doing jobs we shouldn't have been doing, going to places we shouldn't have been going and doing too much work. So the, the first thing is you've got to do is to have more work than you can handle and then use your pricing to, you know, use your pricing to balance the amount of work you're doing. But those days have finished, really. I mean, the days of thousands of conferences. I mean, there, there, was, there was insurance companies that had 3,000 salesmen. So they would do 10 conferences with 300 people in each conference. You know, they keep you working for a fortnight. You know, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about this, Maria, but where's all that gone? 
It's changed, Jeff. It's changed that there's still as many events, but they're different events. It's not, uh, you know, th there are still those big events for sure, but there's a lot more internal events now. Yeah. And so there's sort of, you have we to be able to sort of, too. yeah, you have to be able to do both. But you're absolutely right. You should have put your fees up. Um, and it's it's a shame you didn't. You could have had a whole garage full of Harley Davidsons. I have. You probably have. I, oh, you I, have. I, I, you have. I still, I still, I'm, I'm a, I still think, that the fees I received are good. Were they were, outrageous. Yeah. I still yeah. think it was incredibly generous when a when a when a doctor or a nurse can work for a month for the same money a speaker can get for twenty minutes. It, it does make me feel uneasy. I have this sort of deep seated morality there. So perhaps you know, I don't know. I'm very. I love doing it anyway. I mean, as you can, you know, I do it on buses for free. You know, I, I I entertained the entire surgical ward of Cheltenham General Hospital. You know, I, I actually managed to get one of the nurses crying with laughter. And I, and I mean, I, that's with bits of me missing and sort of people with their hands <laughs> inside me. You know, I, you know, so I mean, you know, I, I don't stop doing it ever. Not until I drop. <laughs> Jeff, you, you, you mentioned there like that, you know, people coming up to you and booking you because they maybe saw you at a conference, they saw you you speak at another event. I'm wondering, like, for you now, the kind of what you do now, um, how do you find most of your work? Maybe I think it'd be useful to to kind of hear how that's changed over the years because we were hearing there in terms of the actual events changing, the nature of events changing. I'm sure like the actual where the, the the inquiries come from. How has that changed over the years? Well, I, I still personally would prefer to get my work from speaking agents. That's what I would prefer, simply because um, they get me a higher fee than I, I'd ever dare ask for myself. They tie the client into contracts, which I've never got. Customers who come direct, they say, have you got a contract? I go, no, just drop me an email. And if they ring up a week before and say, Jeff, um, our managing director has just been eaten by a tiger, we've got to cancel. I go, I know, so what? But the speaking agents would get me a cancellation fee, you know, which I, I haven't got the bottle to ask for. I'm a bit of a pussy like that. So, so agents are the best. Um, I always like to work through a third party. Um, how, but, and yeah. how, when you when, when you got started, though, how did you? Because I think this is a common question by a lot of speakers as it's starting to come through. They start building their own speaking. They go on those those kind of ham salad tours. You know, you tra traipsing up and down the motorways or the highways. But then you yeah. kind of get to the point where you start to get to a level where it's maybe it's attractive to work with a an agent or a bureau. How did you build those first relationships with bureaus? They they approached me. I mean, that's the point that they were queuing up. I mean, it, it, that, it was just such a lucky time. I mean, there was the ISMM, which was a sales conference. They still sort of have it. But it used to fill the Birmingham Conference Center. Fill it. I mean, that's 5,000 people. And every one of the audience were sales managers. It's 5,000 sales managers. My phone didn't stop ringing. And I, I, I mean, the agents didn't stop ringing. I mean, I, I never, I, even now, if I'm feeling sort of dreary and I Google Jeff Birch, I see a speaking agent called Thunderbolt Speakers. I've never done business with them in my life. I don't know who the hell they are. I type in Jeff Birch. They've got my details. We represent Jeff Birch. I've never worked for them in my life. You know, that's, that's a double-edged sword. Because yeah. the speaking agents, every speaking agent in the world has got Jeff Birch. And what clients do now is they shop around. How much for Jeff Birch? Oh, we can get him for a tenner. Well, we can get him for eight quid. No, we're, Jeff, that we've got this client. He's got a budget of six quid. So you get this fight. So the agents mm. don't make any money out of me. I don't make any money out of me. So you get also get the big speaking agencies developing this little herd of speakers that aren't available anywhere else. They might be crap, but it doesn't matter because they can't be found anywhere else. So Were you, were you, were you ever tempted to go that route, to go the exclusive, just say, look, well, I want to make my life easy. I, I and have focus been. On one partner. I've got a friend who's done very well from being exclusive because 
that's all the speaking agent ever offer is him. But I don't know. I, it, mm. I, it wouldn't be good for the international business. Mm. And a lot of the bigger speaking agents have also become my friends. I mean, people like Maria and, and, and so on, you, you know, have become close friends, really. So it, I don't know. I'm a bit crap at this, to be honest. I, I, I just have, the, the, you know, I'm old and festery now. And uh, I, I just get the work just trundles in. But I mean, I, I used to have 10 times as much work as I could do. And now I have one times as much work as I could possibly do. But I, we'll talk afterwards, Jeff. We'll talk. Yeah. I'll help you. <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily want to be starting as a speaker now. And if I was, you've got to have something to hang your hat on. You've got like like James, you your your speciality is creativity. But you get others and you go, well, what do you speak about? And I, I talk mm. about soaring with the eagles. Uh, I talk about believing in yourself. And you go, well. How did you, you know, what what, what about your life? Uh, you know, well, I was a tax clerk for a number of years. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I decided to get into speaking. Uh, what? You know, and are you funny? Are you? But I think, I what? think what, you, what you said there, just previous to that, was just about the international side, not wanting to go exclusive because it does cut you off from the international. That, I think that's the, the amazing thing now probably for speakers I mean, and obviously this has happened for you know a couple of decades though is that we moved to international so that very very defined topic whatever that could be emotional intelligence whatever the, 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 you, that person's taught that topic and they're like the expert on this topic if you'd have just been a speaker let's say in the uk and the uk was your only market there probably wouldn't have been enough work there necessarily no. for you but now international in your market and now over the past couple of years virtual suddenly this very defined thing that you have uh you know that's that's got a, a yeah. global audience for you yeah I, I i've had a sort of renaissance i had a kind of not a low patch but the work the work i had a i had i said had i was busy having my heart rebuilt which took a bit of time um and, and bits and pieces and the t i did a couple of tv series which took you out it, it takes a year out of your life it's a you know, I wouldn't be doing it again. I just do a little bit of guest presenting now. And I think people have suddenly said, oh, I saw Jeff Birch the other day. And the, the, the immediate request is, oh, is he still alive? You know, I used to love him. <laughs> and and uh, I, I suddenly got all these old clients coming out the woodwork saying, I don't know if you remember, Jeff, but about 25 years ago, you spoke to a load of our salespeople. Now we've got all new salespeople. Are you still doing the same messages? Uh, and I go, well, I've got some new material. And they go, nah, we want. It's like hiring Elton John and we not want getting hits. Crocodile we want the Rock. Hits, they want Crocodile Rock. You know, yeah. we want you to do the crapping dog story. I haven't done that for 15 years. No, no, no. We love it. It's very relevant because people suddenly want to sell again. You know, I think there's almost a backlash against this. You know this cuddly new agey thing, and they suddenly realise that, you know, they might be making recycled cardboard clogs, but there's nobody to flog them. You know, <laughs> so you know, I, I I've got a bit of a renaissance going. That's absolutely, nice. absolutely, and just to to um, sort of reassure anybody out there who is starting out, um, there actually is a lot of work, and my bureau colleagues are all back to the 2019 levels, and 2019 was a record year in this industry. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal. So there is there is a lot of business out there. You just need to know where to find it and to position yourself for it, as you said, to be relevant. So you said to us you shared a regret earlier. Um, obviously, uh, I don't want to dwell on the negative side, but has anything ever gone terribly wrong? <laughs> well, <laughs> a, a lot of times. I, but what I was talking to Sally about getting it because we were doing too much work. We were getting a little bit lazy about the background of the clients. And we were told that there was an American, it was an American insurance company were taking their salesmen to Portugal for a big Beano piss up and then there'd be like a, a speech the other day. 
So it's a room full of American salesmen, insurance salesmen, for heaven's sake. You know, so I, I've, I kind of, yeah, I know what this is. I know this audience well. It's a bit naughty. I'll do my cucumber joke. I'll do the whole kind of bit. But we got invited to the gala dinner that night. And they had, because it was Portugal, they had a Brazilian night. So there's all the Americans, all their wives, hundreds of them. And they had this Copacabana dance troupe, women dance troupe. There was 12 of them. And you could have made the costume for the all 12 out of one silk tie and an ostrich feather. Literally. Jang, 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 jang. And the wives just went mad and started covering every their husband's eyes and like there was the band sort of stopped playing and it's chaos it turns out that they were called the something or other of something of salt lake they were all mormons a room full of mormons <laughs> and Sa sally just leant over to me and said should we pop back to our room and rewrite your speech <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I think we better do that." You know, <laughs> lucky so, yeah. escape, lucky escape. So I lobbed in a few <laughs> hallelujahs and uh, you know, "Lord be praised" into this it, all my punchlines. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So, um, James, you have some additional information to share about Jeff and also how people can get in contact with him. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to put a link if you go to speakingbusiness.tv and we'll put a link for um, for Jeff's uh, website and also for his email because I think Jeff, you said, we're always happy to connect on on LinkedIn uh, as well. Um, now you've the got more six the merrier. books. Yeah, huh? You've got six books in print, yep. two on self-employment, three on sales, one on management. Um, but you you were saying earlier that self-made me, you think would be a really good one if people are Want to yes. introduce your work for the first time? Well, not that. It's it's it, it, self-made me is anybody who wants to try and develop their speaking career. It's like any small business. It's how you develop your product, how you market your product, how you find work. Because there's, you know, there's, I keep meeting people with fabulous talent, whether it's speaking, making cakes whatever it is, and all they want is work. You know, if only I could find the work. You know, that is the, the key. You know, I, I spend too much of my time finding my work. Oh, I just want to do my work. And I'm sure most of the viewers out there, you know, they want the work. I mean, you know, I'd much rather be practicing my jokes, my style, my stories, my, my messages than farting about trying to find work and, and self-made me kind of condenses how we can build the value of our personal brand brilliant brilliant Fantastic. you've also got a tool for us haven't you apparently your idea is that we should channel professional burglars um, or yes. use them as role models you're going to have to explain that well it's because sorry about the sun it's shining straight in the window so i've bleached out now but still anyway yes the, bur the burglar is the perfect model for the small business, right? Because burglars don't sit going around, oh, I wish I could find some burgling work. Because they go out and burgle. They don't, do they? They go and do a burglary. It, the work, they find work, right? But here's another thing. If, a burg if you leave a wallet, your wallet on the bar, the burglar will nick your wallet. He doesn't say, no, 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 I just constantly restrict myself to burglin. I wouldn't touch a wallet. No, dishonesty is his driving value. And he uses that to pick up other opportunities in the case of nicking wallets, cars or anything else. Right. So he, he is he is not only does he burgle and that's his skill and he works very hard at being a better burglar, but he would nick your wallet. And that's another thing. If a key is. Look for opportunities that might be outside what you feel your sphere is, right? The next thing is, if he's going to do a bank job, he gets on with Johnny the driver, Billy the safe man, you know, Susie, Susie the sort of, you know, Susie the money launderer, and they work together on the bank job. Whoever's idea it was gets the biggest share, but they don't rent an office, call themselves Robbery Incorporated and do glossy brochures. They work 
well together, complete the job. But because they know they're all criminals, they don't trust each other. So at the start of the relationship, they make sure they're going to get paid. You know, they put in systems to make sure they're not going to get ripped off by their jolly chums. The number of people I meet who have had this great idea or speaking job they haven't been paid for, you know, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of you knowing that you are going to receive what you expected to receive. So they work together. They work well together. The one whose idea it is, has got the bigger share. But if it's the other one's idea, they get the bigger share. They work well. They go their separate ways. And that's like speakers are like that. We, we work. We work. I'll work with, you know, may, maybe Robin Sagers one day and I'm with somebody else the next. I'm, I'm, I'm with, you know, Alan Peace the next day and he's my chum and we co collaborate and then we part our ways. We never want to set up a lasting relationship. Now, if it goes horribly wrong for the burglar, he ends up in prison. But nine out of ten burglars who end up in prison go back to burglary. It doesn't beat him. It doesn't knock him back. He just sits in prison and one of them says, how, what, how did you get in here then? Oh, coppers found my mobile phone at the site of the robbery. Oh, bloody hell, I've done that. What, what have you learned from this? Have you learned to stop burglary? No, I've learned to stop taking my mobile phone with me on jobs, you know? And they come out from prison after a period of reflecting as better burglars. Whereas we, when we fail, we're beat, we're done. It's done, no, it's horrible. You know, the, the, the audience were unpleasant to me, the client wouldn't pay. So what did you learn from that? You know, what did you learn from that? And then go back and do it again. The burglar will be a better burglar every time he does it. And in the end, he'll have a jolly life as a burglar and never go to prison again. He might have gone to prison five or six times, but in the end, he'll get it right. And it, it, it's just that's where the burglar's the model. <laughs> Maria, I, yeah. I, I, can hear, I can hear you just now booking a speaking tour for Jeff around all Her Majesty's prisons to inspire, to motivate the current generation of burglars. True, true story. My son, who is a complete hooligan, is a criminal barrister. Fantastic. I, actually, I was and thinking more like some very helpful business. advice with the help of his dear old dad. <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was actually that another book that was going to be coming out because I thought oh, it it's in self made me the burglar. It's in the You'll self made me. me brilliant, brilliant, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. We're, we're getting some lovely, it. lovely comments from our our viewers. Thank you for all these lovely comments. We, we've run out of time, but James is going to leave us with another tip, not related to crime, aren't you? Or another tool, in fact. Yes, actually, we're just talking about how the business has changed over the years, uh, for good or for bad. Uh, but one of the big areas that's changed is we're seeing a lot of speakers now who are able to almost build part of their speaking business online. And one of the big platforms, one of the big tools that they use for doing this, so offering their online training courses, their online coaching, online memberships, is a platform called Kajabi. Uh, and what we're going to do is we'll put a link to Kajabi because they're actually doing, I think, a 30-day free trial. So you can go and check out Kajabi. If you have expertise on something, maybe go and launch an online course, launch an online membership, launch a, a coaching program around that. So we'll put that at speakingbusiness.tv so you can get your free 30-day trial to Kajabi. Super. And we'll also put links to Jeff so you can contact him. And Jeff's all that's left to say is thank you for being to for doing exactly what you promised, being a bit loon, but being a bit of a give a bit of advice too. We love that. Good. I enjoyed Perfect balance. it. Yes. Super. Okay. Yes. Bye bye everybody and thank you for watching. Thank you, bye bye James. Thank you everyone. Bye -bye, James. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.